Enterprise and Distribution Practice Group. And I want to welcome you today to our uh, the first of our Future of Automotive Return to Business mini-series. Uh, today we're going to be talking about dealership reopening health and safety standards, focusing on auto manufacturers and their relationship with dealers. Um, I'm joined today by Jim Curtis, one of my partners in the Labor and Employment Group. Jim is from our Chicago office and is a workplace safety and OSHA expert who represents nationwide uh, clients um, uh, dealing with o uh, OSHA and workplace safety issues and uh, also something that we're starting to see a fair amount of now given you know, the COVID-19 pandemic is OSHA whistleblower claims. And Jim's going to walk us through some of the OSHA related and workplace safety standards that everybody really needs to be uh, focused on. You can see our agenda. We want to kind of talk about four key things. Uh, protecting the brand. Jim is going to talk about those legal considerations and really the elements of an infectious uh, preparedness and response plan for what the dealer should likely be doing. And then I'm going to come back and finish up on um, some strategies for protecting the brand while minimizing potential vicarious liability related uh, risk. So in terms of protecting the brand, um, Obviously, this is very critical. We're, the country uh, is starting to reopen. Uh, the state and local order, orders are starting to relax a little bit, and dealerships are starting to reopen and um, with and, and really focusing on you know getting people back into uh, the facilities and operations. And as they do, health and safety protocols are going to be uh, paramount. Um, that, you know, customers are going to expect a much different uh, retailing world. They already are um, with sanitized vehicles, home deliveries, valet services, and the like. And lax uh, enforcement by or lax protocols by dealers is certainly going to reflect poorly on the brand. And that's something that OEMs are, and all franchisors and all different systems are obviously need to be uh, focused on. There's liability risk, however, um, for both dealers and OEMs. We see it already. Uh, the cruise industry has been the subject to uh, subject of a number of uh, class action claims um, relating to customer exposure. And I think everybody wants to minimize that potential uh, because clearly exposures that are traced to a particular dealership facility uh, is not going to be good for that particular brand. OEMs traditionally have a number of broad-based and very detailed operation and facility-related guidelines and standards for how their goods are marketed, displayed, what the facilities need to look like, how big they are, and uh, you're going to want to make sure that in this new environment that those your dealers are still doing things the right way in order to protect your brand and to enhance the, you know, the marketing uh, so that consumers are going to feel comfortable going to those facilities to buy, um, to buy cars. The reality is that all of the protocols that Jim is going to talk about and really that we've been hearing throughout the news, um, those COVID-19 protocols are really now part of the customer experience for all retailers, including in the auto industry. And um, I think that it's a fair, a fair thing to say that this is not going to be a short-term thing. That, you know, maybe back in March, we all thought a couple weeks, stay at home, uh, everything will be back to normal pretty quickly. That hasn't uh, played out, and we're likely to see this, um, this new environment operate for a little while. So with that said, what is that new environment, and, and what do dealers really need to be doing, and all businesses really need to be doing in terms of their um, their protocols? And Jim, I'll turn it over to you to to go through some of those issues. Great, John. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone joining today. I know we've got uh, limited time, so I'm going to move quickly here. 
Uh, we will be making these slides available to everyone afterwards. So if you want to go back and reference them, um, you know, from a, a safe and health, safety and health legal perspective, there's really largely four areas um, to look at. There's the state and local executive orders, the OSHA guidance, the CDC guidance. There's also EEOC out there. I'm not going to get into that today because it's a little bit beyond our scope here, but I wanted to make sure it was on your radar screen. Um, the other thing is that this is a very fast moving area as you know, from a, certainly from a legal perspective, it usually takes years to get regs and laws passed. And we're seeing guidance change here from the CDC and from OSHA and others on a sometimes daily, if not weekly basis. So you need to keep up to date on what's going on out there and you need to be aware of any specific guidance that may come out um, with regard to industry specifics. Uh, next slide. So let's talk about state and local executive orders here um, for a minute. Uh, every state has or will be um, implementing restrictions on reopening. Uh, except for Wisconsin, which as we saw yesterday, um, their Supreme Court completely overturned their existing state order and has kind of thrown that into chaos. Um, that's kind of consistent with what we've been seeing out here with a lot of these executive orders. Um, many of them are similar, but they contain critical differences on the details. But we need to know and keep apprised of the details in your specific jurisdictions of what the expectations are for the state and local orders, um, especially with regard to masks, social distancing, uh, employee assessments, and re travel restrictions out there. Those seem to, seem to be some of the most critical issues and those are the things customers are going to be focused on. Uh, most states are implementing a phased approach to reopening. Uh, many counties and um, cities have their own um, public health orders in place as well. You need to keep your eyes on those. They can often be confusing and internally inconsistent um, and they often change without notice. So you need to stay on top of those, seek clarification when necessary. And as we've been advising all of our clients, use the CDC guidelines as a touchstone um, when dealing with unclear orders or if you're uncertain about how to address something. Um, moving on, there's, there are three regional alliances that have developed out there. Keep the next slide. And I just wanted everyone to be aware of this. Um, if not, um, set in stone, even these uh, states are opening at different phases, um, but they're trying to track one another. Um, so just be aware of that. Let's talk about the CDC here for a minute. The CDC has issued restart guidance, um, and the, um, the guidance says on cleaning and disinfecting the businesses. Uh, dealers need to evaluate your options and determine what needs to be cleaned at your facility and develop and implement a cleaning plan um, and update that plan as necessary. I put in here in the next two slides uh, the actual guidance um, from the CDC on restart. I'm not going to go through these, um, but I wanted everyone to have these uh, two slides so you can go back and use them as, as touchstones. Two things I do want to point out in the slides. One, um, it talks about what determining what needs to be uh, recleaned. Um, if, if an area has been dormant for seven or more days, it just needs a routine cleaning. It does not need a deep cleaning. Um, one of the things the CDC also wants everyone to be aware of is making sure that you have sufficient supplies of cleaning um, materials and that those supplies are appropriate for properly disinfecting the area. Um, look to make sure that it's EPA approved. That's a, an easy touchstone for that. So we've got these uh, two CDC guidance documents out there. Let's talk about OSHA. Uh, what does OSHA want? Well, OSHA is looking for you folks to be conducting risk assessments out there. Uh, from the COVID perspective, OSHA's broken down workplaces into four different categories. There's very high risk and high risk. Those are the health healthcare and hospital areas. There's medium risk, which in the medium risk category, that's where we get into workers having frequent contact with travelers or direct contact with the public. Uh, I think the dealerships are likely to be seen as medium risk businesses. There's also low risk, um, and those, that's workers who do not have contact with the public. 
So once you have figured out where you fall within the OSHA hierarchy, you conduct, conduct, conduct your risk assessment, and then what OSHA is looking for you to do is to put into place a preparedness and response plan. So let's talk about that for a minute here. Um, all dealers should develop an infectious disease preparedness and response plan. Our recommendation is that that plan be in writing. Um, it does not need to be complex. It does not need to be an overly detailed document, but it's critical that it be right, um, that you do the evaluation of the workplace and that you put a response place in plan that considers the level of risks associated with the work site and the different job tasks at the work site. Fortunately, you know, dealerships are not overly complex. Um, they're not major manufacturing facilities, but they do have some definite exposure routes that you folks need to be taking into consideration. Um, so you need to consider exposure uh, for employees, customers, vendors, third parties that are coming in on the, uh, your workplace. Uh, you need to consider individual risk factors, such as old age, chronic medical conditions, pregnancy. Um, and uh, you need to consider specific dealership operations. So you've got different areas of the dealership. You may need to treat them differently when it comes to COVID. Sales, service, office uh, operations. Consider each one of those areas as you develop this response plan. So what should be in a good response plan? Go to the next slide. Uh, every, you know, Good hygiene remains the key to every uh, good uh, response plan. A basic plan needs to include the frequent hand washing and use of sanitizers, um, direction to keep employees home if they're sick, considerable uh, flexible work arrangements, possibly telecommuting and staggered shifts where you can. One of the things both the CDC and OSHA has been advising uh, employers is to the extent you don't need to have employees at the workplace, then allow them to commute or allow them to be there at times different than when other employees are there. So that allows you less contact, less exposure, easier social distancing. Uh, discourage employees from sharing workspaces. You know, for decades, right, we've used each other's phones and desks and offices and tools and equipment. We need to begin rethinking that. Uh, the use of face masks is going to be critical by both employees and customers. Uh, the CDC had, has guidance on this, OSHA has guidance on this, and frankly, most executive orders are, nowadays are requiring uh, that people wear face masks. So be aware of that. Um, and make sure you're supplying both the customers, employees with sanitizers and tissues if necessary and proper trash receptacles for them. Your cleaning protocols need to be robust. You need frequent cleaning, especially the common areas. We're talking about break rooms, uh, lobbies, restrooms, co customer seating areas. Most protocols I've been seeing uh, require cleaning at least twice a day. I've seen it up to four times a day. So make sure that that's being done frequently um, and that you're you know, thinking about uh, sanitizing the commonly touched areas, such as countertops, door handles, things like that, and sanitizing the vehicles. Remember, your customers or the customers will be getting in and out of these vehicles, and the next customer is going to want to make sure that it's been properly sanitized. Um, establish policies for workflow, right, and customer interaction. You hadn't given much thought to this before COVID. It's important now in order to maintain your social distancing. So how are employees entering and exiting the facility? How are customers entering and ex exiting the facilities? How are they doing uh, you know, test drives? Uh, the different uh, departments at the dealership. How is the sales department moving about the facility? The service department, the valet service. So in, in, where necessary, consider protective, uh, personal protective equipment if you need to. Uh, you should also consider the facility, the physical facility out there. Um, you may want to do things like increased ventilation at the facility, high efficiency air filters, uh, where necessary, um, a lot of businesses these days are in establishing barriers. If you think about going to the grocery store, which we've all done recently, there's often barriers between yourself and the cashiers. Think about that at dealerships as well, whether you can establish appropriate barriers, like in common seating areas and between desks, 
This allows you to deal with the social distancing issues as well. So those are your basic touchstones from an occupational safety and health perspective. I'm going to turn it back to John to talk about vicarious liability issues. Great. Thank you, Jim. And I know there was a lot there. And as Jim mentioned at the beginning, uh, after the program, uh, we'll be sending out um, a, a copy of the PowerPoint as well as a recording so that you can, you know, you can go back. From, a, from an OEM perspective, obviously customer experience is critical. Uh, we talked about the need to protect the brand. The uh, inclination now is to really dictate to dealers and franchisors in all industries are struggling or are grappling with exactly what should they be doing and how much should they be dictating. I want to just make sure everybody has on their radar screen both vicarious liability and joint employer liability. Both uh, present a risk factor for franchisors and OEMs in their relationship with their dealers and their franchisees and potentially becoming responsible for their failures. Vicarious liability has always been around. It's similar to premises liability. You know, something happens at the facility, they're going to be, if there's a lawsuit, they're going to blame not only the dealer, but they're going to blame the brand and they're going to name the, the franchisor. Vicarious liability really comes down to the amount of control over the day-to-day -day operations. You see a couple of the citations here, but that's really what it comes down to, controlling day-to-day -day operations. And what you're going to want to make sure is that you are setting your brand standards and all of the guidelines that you're putting out are designed to protect the brand and not necessarily control or dictate the precise nature of the day-to-day -day operations. Joint employer is basically a form of vicarious liability. Um, it really hit the franchise scene in 2015 with the Browning-Ferris decision. Uh, the big thing there was not only it changed the standard from even if you just retained the right to control, you could potentially be liable. Fortunately, that has been rolled back with the latest NLRB rule, and you really need two things. You need both actual control and that the right to control isn't enough, and that control needs to be substantial. So I think now what you should be thinking about is, okay, what do I do? How do I protect the brand while still managing all of that risk? And, you know, the fact is all of the dealer agreements that we have dealt with in, in, our, in our experience have some requirement that dealers, franchisees um, comply with all laws. And that's going to be the focus of any directive that you're putting out there. Jim just went through all of those executive orders. Those are applicable laws. Dealers need to be compliance with them, be in compliance with them. So what should you be doing? Number one, let's require compliance with all the government applicable orders. Number two, that Anything that you're pushing out should refer to those CDC and OSHA related guidelines and be pointing dealers to making sure they're going to, um, to, to understand what they are, understand their obligations and comply with them. You're going to want to remain current and up to date and you're going to want to make sure that you're aware of any of these changes. As Jim mentioned, you know, we just had a change in, you know, uh, out there, the, the, the guidelines are changing. You're going to want to stay up to date with that. Frequent and ongoing communications with your dealers is going to be very important. This isn't a one and done, let's push out a, a notice to our dealers and then forget about it. If there's a dealer council or a dealer forum that you can engage, all the better uh, to get kind of buy-in. Share resources. So next slide, please. Share resources. Uh, we'll, we'll attach in, in, and send out a link to the NADA has put out a pretty good guide. As Jim mentioned, the, the, the plan doesn't need to be overly detailed. They've actually hit the, a lot of the basis of what dealers need to be do, doing best practices, share it, encourage them to look at it. Um, coordinating a brand message, there's been a lot of advertising both locally and nationally about everybody, we're all in this together, health and safety and the like, and make sure that there's a coordination of, of, of that kind of effort. As I said, any directives protecting the brand and not dictating actual um, 
actual conduct, there needs to be some flexibility. The, the dealerships post-COVID are going to look different. There's going to be social distancing changes. There's going to be, as Jim mentioned, there might be plexiglass. And, you know, traditionally OEMs have very detailed rules about image standards and what facilities need to look like. I think in today's environment, there needs to be a little bit of flexibility. There should be, you should be aware of what dealers are doing and man, monitor their ops, monitoring their messaging, uh, because you're going to want to know what's going on before it's too late. And the two risk management issues are actually pretty simple. Uh, one is don't dictate specific actions by the dealers. What you're doing is you're focusing on dealer compliance and not necessarily their particular employees. Uh, and make sure your field staff understands that line and not being dictatorial, but really providing the, uh, you know, the guidance. Um, you know, uh, this was a mini webinar series. We wanted to do a quick uh, 20 minutes on a particular topic. Um, you know, we are likely seeing, having seen probably 10 years of evolution in terms of the auto industry in, in the last 10 weeks, and I think it's here to stay. And there, we're going to have to be focusing on a new way of operating. Next week, uh, the second part of our series uh, kind of fits with this. Bill Berkowitz and Caleb Schillinger are going to be talking about how dealers can collaborate amongst themselves to provide some of these now consumer-specific resources and how can they collaborate without violating uh, the antitrust laws. Um, thank you very much for attending. Thank you to my colleague Jim for giving us some information on the OSHA workplace safety. Um, again, if, there, if you have any questions and you sent them in, we will follow up on those. We'll be sending you a, um, a note with a copy of the PowerPoint and with a copy of the recording. Um, I think with, that's it. Jim, thank you very much. Thank you to Thanks everybody. Hope you enjoyed.